Jake. My nigga, I hate it had to be him. Okay, so we are basically done with season one of House of the Dragon. Uh, amazing time. I had a good one watching it. I had a good one experiencing it. I was not uh, skeptic. Like, I, I skeptical? 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 I wasn't skeptical of it. Because uh, I felt like the Targaryens have so much lore that at least been has been rumored to me from the book and from other, even, you know, the series we watched. I mean, the Targaryens were like this, no, there's no way they'd ever come back to power uh, in the early part of season or Game of Thrones. And by the end of it, we realized why these guys were so, I was the opposite of revered, hated, hated by virtually everybody in King's Landing. We got a, a pretty good idea of the context clues. Uh, kind of of the scope of things they really did in terms of uh, negative actions to the realm itself. So I figured that as long as we get some writers that don't absolutely hate doing a good job and we're not looking for their way out of that franchise as soon as possible, I thought we'd get something decent. What we got was a lot better than decent. Now, I'm not going to go into, was this better than season one, Game of Thrones? I think that's, A, I don't think that's a good discussion to have because they literally, as I understand, pretty much just adapted the book one-to-one in that series. This one, it took some, from, again, from I understand, some creative liberties uh, with Viserys' character, uh, with the depiction of Rhaenyra Targaryen, uh, and some other things from what I can gather. So... I, and for me, I don't actually think you need to do faithful adaptations. I really don't. I, I think if you can do a good enough job giving your spin to what the story is saying and, you know, av obviously advertising and market uh, a certain way, no depicted as being a one-on-one -on -one adaptation if it's not, but just do justice to what you are basing your series off of. I think it's fun to have some deviations. And I, as I understand, they didn't have many in this series, but they did have some big ones that I think led to some good prizes. Maybe some minor ones that didn't. I, I understand there's some some um, things with this episode that deviated a bit from the way shit got popping off in the books. Which again, I'm fine. I have not read the books. I don't know when I'll read the books. I have Game of Thrones 1, uh, the first book, in my, in my abode since like 2019. I've not read it. So I don't think I'll be reading House of uh, Fire and Blood anytime soon. So... What this is going to be is not an episode 10 review because I actually thought it'd be so much shit happening in episode 10 I wouldn't be able to review all of it. I feel like this is pretty linear and this is definitely a uh, an appetizer to what will come in season 2 but we're going to go to what I uh, plan for this. So what I did was just take my takeaways and I'm going to kind of expound upon those takeaways. I have about 17. I could probably do a lot more but I just try to capture some of what felt like bigger moments at the time. And um, this was only, I mean, this was a normal regulation episode for House of the Dragon. I think it was like an hour and, uh, let's see. So about an hour of actual content. You know, obviously have like the last 10 minutes and just whatever the fuck. But uh, about the same regulation time as anything else. So 17 takeaways in about an hour. I feel like it's a pretty good amount. So I'll just drop here and then pick back up. This is for heaven. Keep in mind, my laptop is a MacBook from 2016 that fucking blows, so it's probably getting overloaded quite a bit here. I can actually see it as being overloaded, looking at OBS, so keep that in mind if it starts getting a little bit wonky. Uh, so, take away one. Damon wanted this smoke for years and would do anything for it. I think we see that evidence in a lot of different moments. Damon essentially is leading the charge before Renera gets some sense of sensibility in her head while having a premature baby. Uh, she tells uh, the oldest one, who I thought was Lucerus, apparently it's just Sarah's. She tells you, Sarah, just Sarah's, uh, stay on Damon's neck and don't let him do anything crazy. And it, uh, Damon told us some crazy shit, which is for the behest. I mean, I, I think it is really beneficial to the blacks that he does this. They get pretty much all their ducks lined up in a row. They contact, uh, or at least they plan to contact the northern uh, forces that are obviously a little more. Uh, 
kind of neutral in how they want to go about doing this. Um, he kind of puts the fear of God into Desiris, makes him a man a little bit. Uh, he uh, gets the dragons to symbol at least a name. A lot of things he does that are definitely helpful to Renera. Uh, but also that attitude of his, as far as war goes, it's clear that he wants to do better in this fight than he did against the Triarchy and the Stepstones. He's taken more leadership role. Uh, he is clearly the only one with the recent war experience. And uh, he also is someone who wanted to be a king for a while, uh, even though he would have been a terrible king. He wanted to be one. So it's very clear that he wants the Targaryen name as it uh, appeared for you know the last few generations to kind of remain intact and not go to Aegon Targaryen and the Greens who he obviously hates. Uh, I think one little spinoff from his actions that will definitely have lasting con con consequences will be his little uh, spat with Rhaenyra, but I'll get to that later. So that's number one. Number two, was that the most excruciating scene of Game of Thrones history? And a side note was, what the dra what does the dragon cut-ins mean? So, if you don't know what I'm referring to, pretty much open up the, the entire episode. Uh, Rhaenyra is sitting around with Damon. Rhaenys makes it in, and she tells him, Hey, uh, your dad's cooked. Your brother just took over. Yada, yada, yada. And in that, we get this moment. The, the emotions from that spewing in and rolling in at the same time that her baby starts. Uh, pushing and, and trying to get out. Uh, I don't know if this may be some subtext I didn't pick up. I don't know if that was brought on by the immense emotion that she felt from hearing of Viserys' death. It's very evident by all the maesters and the nurses and all that that she was not supposed to be having that kid. So there's definitely something that's happening that caused a kid to come out prematurely. This appears to be her first stillborn kid. Um, and we get... In the funeral for this kid, I feel like we get some moments to kind of tie back into her own mother. Having the kid that eventually killed her. Um, but that kid was not a stillborn. He did die soon after birth. But he was not stillborn. He came about on time. But however, I just think there's some moments that kind of tie in there. And Renera, at that point, it was almost just like, get this kid out of me. Like literally, she says, get out while refusing help, uh, just pretty much doubled over on the ground. The kid just plops out of her. Um, and she's still obviously like wrought with emotion, a lot of different emotions at that moment. But there's definitely some maternal love for that kid. But it, it was just a weird moment. And the dragon cut ins. I'm guessing that that was a show of her intimate bond with her dragon. That's all I could think of at that moment. I'm not sure there's some deeper meaning there. Hell, I thought that I initially I thought the dragon cut was going to lead to her having a damn egg out of her. I, I, I didn't know, but uh, <laughs> I think a, a fucking egg would like literally burst any fucking human being apart. But the point being, I'm not sure what that all meant. But it's clear that at least something is clear to me that there's definitely a, a very high level emotion between her uh, shared emotion between her and her dragon. So. Uh, number three, Emma Darcy is a fucking star. Yeah, Emma Darcy knocks at the park. I, I was one of them, like, realistically, like, actually just tepid uh, individuals about could uh, Emma Darcy and Olivia Cook really outperform the, the two, uh, they're like teenage, but like, they're like teenage slash child actresses, I guess. I don't know what they'd be counted as at that age, but the young women actresses, um, Millie Alcock and Emily Carey, and... I did not know what they could because I felt like there's some real adult emotions that those who had to show just to make these characters feel as good as we've had them feel like. And, and every step of the way, I mean, they felt like legitimate adults since basically episode two. Even episode one, I would say, with the way that her mom goes out. So, I don't know. I mean, these feel like bigger than life characters. And they felt like that when the children were playing them. Now we get the fuck adults that. They did better. I, 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 I don't know if... The thing is, I thought Millie Alcock had maybe a better showing than Olivia Cook, but the thing... Or um, Emily Carey. But the thing is, like, 
her character had to be more varied in emotions and also her character's got more screen time. Uh, so I don't know. I, I thought Olivia Cook did a, uh, Emily Carey did a wonderful job in her last episode where she pretty much had to represent uh, Alicent having a 100% turn against her former sister. So I thought that episode was amazing. Maybe the best portrayal we've had of uh, Allison Hightower in the whole series. I mean, you can definitely make an argument one way or the other, but I circle back to Renera. I thought that just a range of emotions to be displayed in this episode alone. She has to try to stick to her bond with the concept of peace with Allison Hightower, with the Targaryens and that, King's Landing, uh, the Greens. She has to be a leader. She has to at least entertain the idea of war. She has to be a, uh, not a peacemaker, but, uh, well, she does pretty much play the role of peacemaker uh, in comparison to Damon. She has to be a, uh, what's the, what do you call it? Um, like a person who bargains. Uh, she has to play the role of pretty much agent with Corliss and via uh, her kids with the other lords of the north. So, and even she has to kind of convince Rainus a little bit, like, hey, I'm still, you're still doing this, right? So, I mean, there has to be love, the motherly love that she displays, especially to Jaceris. Um, and it's just so many different things that, uh, Lucerus, my bad. And she has, she has some motherly moments with uh, Jaceris, but Lucerus, and then with the stillborn kid and all of that. So, uh, it's just so much things you have to show in this one episode that, Allison had to do a little bit of that too in her previous episode, but not near to the same effect. So, I thought Emma Darcy just did a wonderful job. And I thought, I didn't know what MC, Emma Darcy felt like to me to be someone who was seen, um, able to portray like female emotions, like, um, kind of the soft skills of, of female emotions that well. She just seemed like to be more of a, a brutal character, which she does a wonderful job of displaying the brutal aspects that are required of uh, Rhaenyra Targaryen's positions. But, I know like, well, she's doing the soft skills part of this character and she does a wonderful job in my opinion uh number four Viserys crown uh clear as amens yeah so that's the that the crown that i don't know if it's eric with an a or eric with an e but that sir eric when he pulls up with that crown that's the same crown that Viserys had um the crown that they give aegon targaryen believes aegon the conquerors no aegon I, i've said aegon i meant aegon the one to give Aegon number two is, I believe, Aegon number one's crown, the Conqueror. So, the knife, the uh, prince that was promised, a uh, little knife, I forgot what it's called, like black something, something like that. Uh, that goes to Aegon, but somehow, I guess, Eric got the crown from Viserys and gives that to Rhaenyra, so she's wearing her father's crown. It's a wonderful moment when uh, Damon presents it to her, sort of like the way he presented it to Damon in the previous episode, or to... Um, Viserys in the previous episode. So I thought that was wonderful and it's just a nice touch. It also looks way better. Uh, some really emotional consistency from Damon is all you can ask for. So yeah, I, I think one thing with Damon that I think is tough for some people who watch this series uh, is that he goes from being a very emotional individual that is not only just raw to you know, his wife or in the comfort of his own home, but sometimes in public. Uh, as you can see with Damon, so or with the Viserys, I'm sorry, I'm fucking up here. And we haven't gotten a ton of like real love and adoration, like what that feels normal from um, Damon to Rhaenyra. And he even like when war is calling, he has an option. He literally is called over by Nyra to come over and help while she's going through the pain and torment. And he says, "No, I'm going to stay here and do my thing." I don't know. I, I to me, my interpretation of that was that he did not want to be in there again, and the potential because I mean they could literally hear her screaming. I don't think he wanted to be there again to potentially have to make a bad decision, like he had to do what he was supposed to have done with the uh, Lena uh, back when she was going through a very painful uh, childbirth. I I don't I didn't read that as him like being callous again and like not wanting to go into uh, you know something that he feels is less important. I legitimately felt like he just did not want to be another. What well, was a very obviously painful situation for him outside of just losing his wife or whatever that was supposed to be his way into Driftmark. Um, I thought it was a literally a situation where he just his his. I don't think he could handle 
and then make a decision again. And we have some other sad moments after that where he kind of mourning the baby. He's like sitting on the fucking uh, little castle, kind of overlooking the sea. And we don't get too much more like emotion, at least of the sad variety from him the rest of this episode. He does present the news of uh, our boy's passing uh, at the end of the episode, but we don't really. It's kind of a silent moment until I think it's literally. I don't think there's any words displayed that in that uh, scene. I think it's just music that plays. But uh, we don't really get his kind of read on that situation. And it's not his kids. I'm not sure how you would have felt about him. But yeah, so we get that. Uh, I, it was just nice to just get like some continued consistency between some of the uh, opening up of uh, Damon that we got last episode. Uh, it was good to also say because it confirms that that wasn't just a ploy. That, um, you know, he didn't just, you know, kind of butter up his brother for the sake of getting the confirmation of uh, Gisera's and Lucera's as legitimate kids of uh, the Valerian bloodline. And, um, what's not the moment we got? Oh, yeah, when um, he finds out that Viserys died and he theorizes immediately that Allison has something to do with it because Raina didn't know how he died. He kind of talks about his brother again. Again, I don't know if that's just his hate and disdain for the Greens and Allison and, you know, whoever, but. Seemed to me like to be some real more uh, brotherly love there displayed. So I don't know, but just good to get some more. You know, when I say emotional consistency. Really mean just like some more sad out of that. Uh, Damon. So we now have Rain is not knowing it's so badass. So yeah, Rain has a lot of moments, uh, kind of towards that. The whole crowning of Al uh, Rhaenyra, where she's just like. Stoic. Like, she's not crying. She's not fucking boohooing. She's not championing Renera. She's just like, yeah, this is what's happening. Okay, I'm partaking. I'm going to help you guys out because we promised, but you're not going to get me kneeling any of that shit. She's stoic. She's down the middle, still emotionally. Like, I know she's in allegiance to the blacks, but she's not going crazy, uh, nut hugging them, anything like that. And, you know, she, in the confines of talking to her husband, she's like, I respect the fuck out of Rhaenyra. She did exactly what I would have done, which Brains literally did avoid war by not killing uh, Allison and the rest of the Targaryens. She's not, she's not gonna do any of that shit, you know, but, you know, she, she's prepared. She's smart. And I, I think that's such an amazing moment because it kind of couples with the way that she perceived uh, Rhaenyra as a queen prospect so many years ago. You know, I, I don't think it was just like she's a woman type of thing. I think she really just did not know if Renero was that good a prospect because I think she compared Renero to probably herself as a prospect and probably thought she was a much better queen uh, potential than Renero would have ever been based on Renero at that moment as a kid. But you now she's like, she's done exactly everything I could possibly ask her to do. I couldn't help but back her really at that moment. And I think she tried to, she really did, I think, convince Corliss a little bit to. Stay on the side of, uh, stay, stay on his side when he wanted to be neutral. So that was cool, I guess. Uh, let's see. I have, that was since we got done. I have 17. So I'm going to end on this one. I'm going to end on this one. How stark Winterfell. It's clear that they, I don't know if it's because of, it's a, not necessarily Easter egg because it's pretty obvious. Like, it's how stark. It's not anything that's subtest, but. I don't know if they did it to like drum up some level of love from the original series and fans who still love that one probably more than this one. I don't know if it's because of that. I don't know if because House Stark will have a ton of importance in this war. Uh, we got the, the North mentioned at least every five seconds after this point on. I mean, the North is pretty much the biggest uh, neutral, it seems like, even though it's supposed to be allegiance uh, allied with Rhaenyra. It's clear the North has to have importance, and we only got Baratheon and Storm's End, but we also have the Aarons, and we have the Tollys, and the Starks. Uh, that should still be displayed eventually. Uh, so, I thought that was cool that we just get so much Stark. I mean, I think regardless of how the series ended, even with the Starks pretty much like clean sweeping, and some people may be being bitter because of that, there's so much goodwill the Starks have from that series, and it becomes basically a Stark series at a certain point. So 
I think they have so much goodwill. And even if it was just to get some cheap, you know, I'm so fucking excited. Let's go for season two. I think it was still cool that they gave us some some stark love there. So this is already 16 minutes. I'm going to end this here and then just do multiple parts. I'll them on multiple days. Uh, I'll come back and like hyperlink uh, the next episode in this one and harken back to this one in the next episode. Uh, if you're watching this, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I love all of the support that I've gotten on these House of Dragons uh, videos. Getting any kind of views and any kind of consistency is new for me, so I'm, I'm glad to have pretty consistent feedback uh, and, and viewership on uh, the previous ones of these. So, let me come back to this. This is number seven, so I'm going to start with... Uh, what, we should be able to knock out 8 through 17, because some of these are pretty much hitting some of the same notes. So, we should go to the other half in the next episode.